Does Meister Eckhart really say that prayer isn't necessary and that we should be free of it? Well, if you're already united with God, then yeah, kind of. But at the very least, what Eckhart has to say about prayer is surprising. It's not going to be exactly what we expect. So let's take a look at a passage first that you may have heard of. But now I ask, what is the prayer of the detached heart? And I answer and say that detached purity cannot pray. For whoever prays asks God to give something to him, or asks God to take something from him. Now the detached heart wants nothing, and there is nothing more that it could be free of. Therefore, it stands detached from all prayer and cannot pray for anything other than to be one with God. All of its prayer stands on this. Now, this is a passage that you might have heard of because it has one particular phrase that sounds really extreme. And one of the reasons that this happens is because of the little word Leidich in Middle High German. And Leidich can be translated as free. In other words, you can read this as, it stands detached from all prayer, or you can say, it stands free of all prayer. Saying that you stand free of all prayer means it sounds like you've done away with it, that you've just cast everything aside. But that's not really what's going on here. So, Leidic in this sense means unattached. So, the word itself means single or unmarried. And so, it's unattached and unencumbered. And so, what we're talking about here, because it is detachment, and detachment for Eckhart, he says, is the highest virtue. So, he has a treatise called On Detachment, where he discusses this at length. And so the idea is something like this. Attachment is attachment to the things of the world. And so any kind of differentiated thing, so anything that can be distinguished from anything else, is a possible attachment. And that is a point of separation from God. And so the whole idea is to return to God. Anything that gets us back to God, okay, that's good, that's going to be the highest virtue. And for Eckhart, of course, that, in its comprehensive nature, is going to be detachment. So detachment is what characterizes the doing away with all of these attachments, the doing away with all dualism and all differentiation. And so that's what's really going on here. And so when he says, you know, what is the prayer of the detached heart? Well, this is the individual who has accomplished complete detachment. In other words, who has achieved union with God. And so, of course, such an individual, qua union, qua God, is going to be uh, incapable of praying in the sense of, you know, beseeching or asking. And we still have this sense in English today, right? When we say, you know, and it almost sounds archaic, you know, I pray thee, you know, to do something. Um, so I ask you to do something. I want you to do something. And so those, those words are very similar. They're not exactly the same in either the Latin or the Middle High German, but the sense is similar, and, and Eckhart uses them uh, side by side, both in this passage and in others. So I, I think that makes it uh, a little easier. In other words, reading this as unattached makes it a little easier to understand what's going on there and why it is that the detached soul cannot pray because there is nothing to ask because the detached soul is already one with God. And so as God, there is no reason for it to ask for anything. So I think that's what's going on there. Now, What's interesting about this is that the topic of prayer for Eckhart is something that made its way not only in the articles that were submitted and were part of the inquisitorial you know, proceedings, but were actually a part of the articles in the, uh, the papal bull, the condemnatory bull in Agra Domenico in 1329, which condemned some of these sayings of Eckhart. And so we're going to have to talk about that a little bit, but first let's take a look at what Article 7 actually says, because Article 7 is the one that deals specifically with this idea and with prayer. And so the article says, quoting Eckhart, He who prays for this or that prays badly and for something that is bad, because he is praying for the negation of good and the negation of God, and he asks that God be denied to him. Okay, so in other words, praying for anything in particular, this or that, this is the hook et hook. Uh, of of Eckhart, and so that's a you know fairly well known Latin expression in Eckhart in Eckhart studies. You hear about it a lot, and it refers to any kind of particularity, any kind of differentiated thing, any kind of corporeal and earthly thing, and that's going to come up later in his uh, treatise on the Lord's Prayer. 
So, anyway, praying for anything in particular, asking for anything in particular, is tantamount to asking to be denied God. Because asking for a particular is not to be in divine unity. It is not to be completely united with God without any distinction. And so, because of that, you are asking to be put at a distance for God, from God by asking for something specific. And that's ultimately what's meant here, and that's not all that terribly unreasonable. It's not even necessarily all that terribly unorthodox. And we can see why, I think, in going back to the original for, uh, that this article was drawn from. So, a lot of the material that made it into Inagra Domenico was taken from his Latin sermons, because those are a lot more... Uh, Latin sermons and treatises, because those are a lot more... Um, you know, easy to validate. They're, they're a lot easier to validate. They're a lot easier to see, okay, this is definitely Eckhart, rather than, you know, sermons that happen to have been copied down in some dialect or something where he can say, oh, I didn't really say that, uh, which he did say about a lot of the other things that he was accused of. And so when they whittled down the final list, you ended up with a lot of them in Latin because, I mean, these were things that he wrote inside of the church. So, here, we're talking about his commentary on John, and this is uh, part of paragraph 611. Now, unfortunately, 611 is part of the, um, the, the portion of that book that has not been translated into English. So, I have a section of it here that I've translated for you, and uh, let's, let's step through that. So, this is a little bit longer, but it provides some context as to, especially here, one of the things that was condemned, so I think it's important. He says, furthermore, let us say in another way that the one who prays for this or that does not know what they are praying for, because it is evil and wicked. For this and that smack of negation, which multiplicity truly includes by its very nature, the negation of which is one, one, I say, which is convertible with being. Consequently, this and that falls away from the one. In the one, there is no real negation but rather the negation and exclusion of all negation and multiplicity, which this and that implies. Augustine, in On the Trinity, says, This good and that good, take away this and that, and you will see God. It is clear, therefore, that one who prays for this and that asks for evil and prays wrongly, because he prays for the negation of good, the negation of some being, and the negation of God. Therefore, he does not pray for or ask for God, but he prays for and asks to be denied God, to be denied existence, the true and the good. And so then, perhaps, at the end of the Lord's Prayer, we pray to be delivered from evil, that is, not to seek the evil that is contained in all things. Okay, so the first thing I think that stands out to us is that the passage that he quotes from Augustine is very similar to the article that was condemned as part of the bull. And so, this may make us, you know, scratch our heads and say, okay, well, you know, Augustine is a, a pretty good source, you know. I mean, one of the doctors of, of the church, uh, so one of the few that has been recognized as a, a teacher, so doctor means teacher, as a teacher of the orthodoxy. And so, it's hard to do much better than Augustine. And indeed, he is Eckhart's favorite. So, of all of the people that Eckhart cites, he cites Augustine the most. So, anyway, not surprising there. Now, how do we adjudicate this? How do we figure out what's going on? Well, it's very simple. You see, the condemnatory bull, people frequently hear about this and say, oh, well, you know, Eckhart was a, a heretic. He was condemned. Well, no, he was not actually condemned. And so, Timothy Radcliffe, the uh, head of the Dominican Order, uh, in the, the early 90s, petitioned the Pope for the rehabilitation of Meister Eckhart. And uh, Pope John Paul II wrote back and said, it's actually not necessary to rehabilitate him because he was not condemned by name. Only some things that he was reported to have said were censored. And so, you may consider him, the Pope said, a perfectly orthodox theologian. This is very different, I think, than the reputation that, that Eckhart frequently gets, knowing that he went through an inquisitorial proceeding for a number of years. And that's something that we'll, we'll have to address at a different time, because there's a lot uh, going on there as well, which is, is very, very interesting. Uh, so it's the sort of thing they can make a movie about, I'm sure. But anyway, so that being said, there were a couple of 
specific aspects of the bull and what they were interested in that concern us here. The first is the phrase malisonantes, which means evil sounding. And so they were concerned with things that sounded evil. Now, notice what's really important about this is that something that sounds evil all you're worried about is the reception of that thing. How does it sound to the listener? So the impact then is on the listener rather than being concerned with the content of what's being said. And that's really important, right? Because that means that they're not actually condemning the content of what's being said. <laughs> they're condemning the way in which it is likely to be received. That's a very different thing. Now, the second consideration is very much like this, and this is spelled out in the bull, where they say that it is likely to produce, you know, problems, doubt, in the minds of the, uh, of the uneducated. In other words, this might be perfectly fine for the theologians, the other masters of theology. So, Eckhart was a master of theology. It was the highest rank that you can attain, the medieval universities, uh, which made it doubly unusual that anyone of that rank should be you know, put before an inquisitorial hearing. Like I said, there's a story behind that, but nevertheless. So, this is all about how it was received. So, was it evil-sounding? Was it likely to produce problems in those who heard it? Well, that has nothing to do with the content. That has to do with how it is received by people, which means that the condemnation was a kind of, okay, let's put a wall around this and try and prevent too many people from you know, being exposed to it for whom it might be dangerous. That's a very different thing than saying that Eckhart's theology itself is unorthodox. And so I think that helps to try and explain why it is that he appeals to Augustine here. It seems very similar to what Augustine had to say. So recall, Augustine, in the passage that he quotes, this good and that good, take away this and that, and you will see God. I mean, that's awfully close to what Eckhart has in his formulation. So, Okay, I think that's um, I think that's relevant, and I think that's kind of interesting. Now, so there's something else here. So, and this is something that well, it hasn't been highlighted, but it hasn't been translated. So the word that I translated here as smack, in other words, for this and that smack of negation. Now that might seem a little bit strange, but uh, that's only because it's not used as as often. So the word is uh, to smell. So sapera, and to smell, to smack of, to partake in. So oftentimes, and I think this would probably be translated just partakes in. So multiplicity partakes of negation in the sense that anything that is a part of the world of multiplicity, in other words, the dualistic world where we're not in divine unity, so we're in the corporeal world of different things where things are different from each other, and in that world, multiplicity, for us to have multiplicity at all, you have to have a thing that is not another thing. And so things are defined by what they are not. And that's, by the way, a peculiarly modern sort of notion. I mean, this was something that was revived, um, I don't know about revived, but at least it was popularized and became a part of um, linguistics. And I I'm thinking of Jakobson in particular here, but uh, and uh, de Saussure, but nevertheless. So, um, okay. So I think that's kind of interesting. Now, the other bit here that is worth noting is that Eckhart comes very close to the negatio negationis, so the negation of negation. And that's another bit of Latin that he's famous for. And so the passage in particular that I'm thinking of is where he says, in the one, there is no real negation, but rather the negation and exclusion of all negation and multiplicity. <laughs> and so this is very close to the negatio negationis. So the negatio negationis means the negation of negation. And this is one of the ways that he describes God. And God is distinct in his indistinctness. And, you know, similar sorts of paradoxical sounding formulations. But it's the same kind of idea that you have here. And so in the one, there is no real negation. So in the one, you have the negation and exclusion of all negation. Well, the exclusion of all negation is the negation of all negation. That's one way of, you know, kind of uh, paradoxically putting it, which is what he does elsewhere. So he doesn't do it here, but it comes awfully close. So anyway, that's, that's there as well, which I think is, uh, is very interesting. Okay, so let's move on. There is a passage also in the second sermon, which is well known, and so this is the little castle. This concerns being possessively attached to prayer, and it runs as follows. All of those who are bound with attachment to prayer 
fasting vigils, and all kinds of exterior exercises and mortification. Any attachment to any actions takes away the freedom to attend to God in this present now and follow Him alone in the light in which He shows you what to do and what to leave undone, renewed and free in every present moment, as if you did not possess, nor desire, nor even could do anything else. Every attachment or premeditated action that deprives you of this freedom in each new moment. This is part of, and he hits this over and over again in the different sermons, and so I'm not going to mention all of the different passages that concern prayer because there are just far too many of them, but they are all of a similar character. So we're going to hit those that are kind of representative of uh, the different flavors that we get. And this is one of them. And this is prayer as concerns external works. Now, I've also talked about Sermon 1, which is the casting the merchants out of the temple. And if you recall there, when the merchants are cast out of the temple, the reason for this is that they are negotiating. So they are buying and selling with God. And Eckhart uh, compares this to people who are praying and are buying and selling. They are negotiating with God, saying, I want this or I want to be free of that. You know, I want something wonderful for my family, or I want to be free of this disease, or something of the kind. And he calls this a negotiation and likens it to a mercantile exchange with God. And the whole implication there is that this is beneath God, and that this is in the realm of distinction, in uh, duality, in multiplicity, and is at a distance, therefore, from God. And so in Sermon 1, he speaks of, you know, casting out all those who would do this sort of thing in any kind of mercantile thing, anything that is beneath God, and specifically mentions it in the context of purifying the temple so that it can be a comfortable resting place for divine unity, in this case specifically for Christ. And we get a similar sort of thing in Sermon 2, but he's speaking specifically about external works. And so it's not just prayer, but it's attachment to any external work. And so Eckhart is not one of those who says that, you know, well, you have to accrue a certain amount of merit or that all of these things, you know, with prayer and fasting and vigils and all the penances and things that he mentions, uh, he's not going to say that those are worthy on their own. They are only worthy instrumentally in the sense that they get you somewhere, that they get you closer to God. If they affect some of that movement to get you closer to God, then they have done uh, what they need to do and they are useful. So, now this is something that will come up later. And uh, we're going to see this, we're going to see this again in Sermon 38. And so, Here he says, you know, if somebody was to ask me, why do we pray, why do we fast, why do we perform all of our good works and devotions and and the fastings and vigils and that sort of thing? Why are we baptized? He goes on, why are we baptized? Why did God come into the world? So in other words, not just external works, but all kinds of things associated with Christianity, including some of the absolute most important. And he says, I would reply, uh, in order that God be born in the soul and the soul be born in God, that's why the whole of Scripture was written, and that's why God created the whole world. Well, that's a strong statement. This is a strong statement in favor of the instrumental use of all of these things, in saying that really what matters in the end is the return to God, the return and the union of God, uh, union with God, which is understood and described here as the you know God being born in the soul and the soul being born into God, and so this is this chiasmus that. Eckhart is famous for, where he takes a phrase like, the soul is born into God, and then reverses it, and God is born into the soul. And what that does, that that chiastic formulation, really melds the two together, and cements the ideas together, and indicates a significant intimacy of those things, and says, okay, we should consider those entirely together. And so this is something that I discussed in my book, uh, Paradox at Play, in the context not only of chiasmus, but also of uh, the little words, so the little connecting words, which is what we're all very familiar with, that, you know, in and with and by and through and of. And so you string all those things together, then you've said, okay, it is intimately related in every conceivable way. (laughs) In, by, through, of, with, you know. And... um, so that's the same kind of thing that, uh, that he accomplishes here, but in a smaller form with the chiasmus. So anyway, I, I think that's kind of interesting. Um, so again, it's all instrumental. And as I like to say with uh, Buddhism, everything is a tool. So that with Buddhism, 
everything, everything about it. So the order, the rules, the scriptures, everything is just a tool to get you to enlightenment. And Eckhart recognizes something that's very similar, and it's formulated in distinctly Christian terms in saying that everything is for the sake of the reditus, the return to God. And that return to God implies a return through and in shedding all differentiation, uh, detaching oneself from any kind of attachment, any kind of differentiation, multiplicity, any kind of carnality and temporality. That's the kind of thing that we hear in his Latin treatise, uh, Super Orationa Dominica. So this is on the Lord's Prayer, where he says, nothing temporal is asked of God in the Lord's Prayer. I don't know if you've noticed this. Nothing temporal is asked of God. The Lord's Prayer contains nothing of this kind. And then he ends by saying, For you will ask and not receive what you wrongly asked. Wrongly here means carnally or temporally. So he spells it out for us. This is one of the rare places where he really spells it out. Uh, and that's what I had in mind there. So carnally, temporally, in other words, not eternally, not beyond the body and the confines of any given body, any given differentiated thing. So, I think, um, I think that's kind of interesting. Okay, so now let's move on to one of the passages from Sermon 5b. And so here he says, people often say to me, pray for me. Then I think, why go out? Why not remain within yourself and take hold of your own good? You carry all truth in you in its essence. Okay, so there are a couple different things going on here. First of all, the emphasis is on interiority. Don't go outside. Don't go external with respect to your focus on works and things that you can do. Turn internally and turn internally so that you can take hold of the spark, the goodness, the being that is already there. The God is already there. We just have to set down all of the other things that are preventing us from being able to partake of, to taste of God, which is the metaphor that he uses in terms of experiencing, uh, experiencing God. So I think I think that's uh, I think that's kind of interesting. I, and I realized I forgot to mention something earlier with the uh, the bit from six eleven in the commentary on John. So he mentions convertible. So something is convertible, and this was a common thing in medieval theology, where you spoke of, you know, the different transcendentals being convertible with God. And so, you know, the greatest good, the greatest justice, the greatest love, these sorts of things. And um, so anyway, that's, that's part of that. And all of this points in the same direction. I mean, the whole thing, the way that I like to describe it is that Eckhart describes a tight orbit around God. And so he never leaves God for very long. He's always doing this kind of fast dance around God, you know, like a, a planet in an eccentric orbit that is, you know, whipping around the star and always returning to it. And so you have this kind of yo-yo slingshot dance-like motion where you're never very far from God for very long with Eckhart's rhetoric. And he won't let you go too far into the carnal and temporal world, even for the sake of doing good theology, which is fascinating to see in his, in his Latin works. So, um, okay. So I should say there, by the way, um, just as a kind of point of reference, so Eckhart scholars have disagreed historically, not as much recently, on whether the Latin works differ from the vernacular works that are in Middle High German. And uh, I come down on the side that uh, they, they do not differ, that they are expressing the same thing, but to different audiences. And I think this is becoming more of a commonplace, that there's not really a difference in audience. I mean, frequently you have a you know, significant density in terms of the theology that's presented. Eckhart is more willing to use you know, certain scholastic terms like you know, convertible or you know, whatever else that might be familiar to his, um, his more learned audience uh, in Latin. But aside from that, he frequently uses terms that are uh, directly taken or tra um, translated from the Latin to the Middle High German, which is, is kind of interesting. So he has equivalent expressions in both for a lot of his major ideas. Okay. All right, so moving on. In the Book of Divine Consolation, section 2, he says, There can be no good man who does not will what God specifically wills. For it is impossible for God to will anything but good. So we pray every day that God's will be done. 
So I hope that you're seeing now, after going through a number of these passages, the same kind of thing coming up over and over again, right? So this is a repetition of a number of the themes that we've already heard, and I think you'll find that with any given passage in Eckhart that you get used to reading him, and one of the reasons you get used to reading him is because he repeats himself over and over again. And his repertoire was actually, and I was surprised at this when I first started doing my, you know, uh, I have a comprehensive study that I did of his metaphors, and um, I was surprised that his, me- his repertoire was actually relatively limited, and he draws from the same metaphors over and over and over again. And so when you find one that is actually very unusual, it's like, well, okay, is that even Eckhartian? Like, maybe that's not his. You know, maybe it's someone else's, uh, which is kind of interesting. And that's something specifically that come up, comes up with the metaphor of uh, greening. So, uh, you know, a shoot, a sprout, so a new plant. That's something that um, he has been accused of taking from the Beguine mystics, so the female mystics of the time. And uh, so we'll have to discuss that at another time. But anyway, suffice to say, most of his metaphors he's going to repeat over and over again. And so a lot of his images you're going to see again and again, and that's what happens here. And so he says, there can be no good man who doesn't will what God specifically wills. Well, that really sounds Augustinian, doesn't it? In uh, the Confessions, Book 9, where he finally affects his you know, conversion of will and, uh, and merges his will with God's will, aligns his will with God's will. Now, finally, I wanted to mention the bit that you've probably heard, Eckhart is famous for saying this, where this is the prayer of thanks. And he says, if someone had nothing more to do with God, Other than that he was thankful, it would be enough. Now, you probably haven't heard that version of it. You've probably heard it in the context of prayer, that if someone was to utter only one prayer, and it was a prayer of thanks, then that would be enough. But in fact, the original doesn't say prayer. (laughs) So it's referring to to action. And uh, that is perhaps even more meaningful, because it's saying that if you're going to have anything to do with God at all, then... If it is to be thankful, that will suffice. That is enough. And so the story that I like with this, or the image that I like with this, is similar to one that Eckhart uses himself, where he says the, uh, you know, a a thirsty soul being offered a glass of cold water. And if you think about this, it's a very vivid experiential image, such that everyone knows what it's like, right? You know, you're in a hot day, maybe you've been running or exercising or playing a game or whatever it might happen to be, and you're really, really hot, and you finally get, you know, a big glass of cold water, and it is so unbelievably refreshing, and it makes your, you know, your whole body not only refreshed and revitalized, but also relaxed and fulfilled, satisfied. And so that is the sense, by the way, of enough is satisfied. And I think that's I think that's really important here because I liken this to thanks to being a, a full body relaxation. So it is like, you know, oh, thank you. <laughs> and that sense I think captures what it is that Eckhart is is going for there. If the only thing that you have to do with God is to relax, to completely relax, as if to say, I'm going to set down all of my hindrances. I'm going to set down all of my attachments. And so in setting those down, you become completely detached and can breathe and say, "Ah, thank you. Then that will be enough.